All right. Welcome to episode number 16 of the Dan Time Podcast. I'm your host, Dan McArdle. Back with you. For your benefit, I hope, presenting to you the best that I can find and book from the Daniverse. What a run of guests we've had. I'm not just saying that. What a bunch of just decent people doing great things, things that you ought to check out or go see. How about Dan Thomas? Did you like that episode? Are you going to be in Germany, the Netherlands, Luxembourg in December? If so, I recommend, of course I do, but really go catch a Dan Thomas performance. We've had stand-up comedians Dan Altano and Daniel Eaches on the show over the past few weeks. Both these guys are going to be out there on the road into 2024. Make sure you follow all my guests on social media to stay current with their whereabouts. So the holidays have officially begun. Thanksgiving is behind us. You made it. You got through. How was that experience for you? How was the traveling, the hosting, the visiting, whatever you were doing, the chatting and hugging and smiling and, hey, how are you guys, do- how you been? How are you doing? How's she doing? How's how's your job going? How's all that working out? How are the kids doing in school? What's going on with that thing that you are dealing with? Let's hear all about that. Looks like you got your hands full. What did What went down for you over the holidays? It, it, whatever, you made it. You, you're here. You're back on the Dan Time Podcast, back in your work week, and you don't have to deal with that for another few weeks. But, you know, hopefully you did have a great time, and you saw some people that you only see a couple times a year that you really love to see. My guest today is New Orleans musical theater actor and performer Danny Rubio. This is a big deal for me, and I'm so happy to introduce Danny to you. Performing is just in his blood. Nowhere is he happier, nowhere than on stage. You'll notice right away that Danny is not your average guy. And when you say go, he's on. He's on 100%. We had a short history together in person 12 or so years ago, and the bond was formed and we are forever friends. Danny studied theater at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa and was always involved in theater growing up. However, it would be about two decades after graduating before Danny returned to the stage. He shares the story in this conversation about why it took so long and what inspired him to make his grand return to performing in musicals. Some of the roles that Danny has portrayed have included Peter in Company, Caiaphas in Jesus Christ Superstar, Ed Mackey in The Best Little Whorehouse in Texas, The Mayor in Newsies, and R.F. Simpson in Singing in the Rain. If you're in the New Orleans area, you can catch Danny this weekend, December 1st through 3rd, in Scrooge the Musical at Dockville Farm. Also, March 15th through 24th, in Jesus Christ Superstar at Jefferson Performing Arts Society. Later in May, the 3rd through the 19th, you can see Danny in Sister Act the Musical at Rivertown Theaters for the Performing Arts. All right, to keep up with all of Danny's performances in 2024 and beyond, please follow The Company, a St. Bernard Community Theater, also Jefferson Performing Arts Society, and Rivertown Theaters for the Performing Arts. Check out their social media pages, like and follow. And if you'd like to talk to Danny directly, I'm sure he'd love to hear from you. Send him a message, send him a friend request on Facebook, Danny Rubio. Danny Boy, in parentheses, and he tells the story in our conversation about the Danny Boy nickname. You're going to love it. We also talk some Saints football, New Orleans restaurants, and of course, a good bit of side chatter. I think you're going to love this conversation, so let's get to it now. Ladies and gentlemen, it is Danny Rubio time. Man, I can't believe it's been so long since we have spoken, connected, and by way of this podcast... We're actually, I've facilitated a conversation with you, and if nothing else, that's a success. I am just thrilled to have you on the show and be talking to you today. How are you doing, Danny? I am doing great, Dan. 
thank you so much. Uh, it has been a long time, man, like 12, 13, 14, some odd years. Um, but you know, us Dan's have to stick together. So that's right. Uh, that's why I'm here. Uh, so yeah, man, thank you so much for having me on the show. I listened to quite a few of them and, uh, man, do I love listening to stories about Dan's, you know, how could you not, how could you not? We are a community. You know, I heard the Ryan convention. I really wasn't up to speed on that type of stuff where they actually, all these Ryans get together. Have you heard of that? I have heard of it. I've seen some, uh, some, uh, social media posts about them and, and whatnot. Um, I feel like if we had our own Dan get together, it would be even a smaller uh, group. I think I feel like there's less Dannys or Dan or Daniels around than there are Ryans and Bryans and stuff. So I feel like we would be like even on, on a higher tier than those Ryans. You know, I agree. I appreciate what they're doing. For me, I don't know if I want to take it that far. Um, and I, and I kind of agree with you that I don't know if we'd have the turnout. Um, but we actually. I, I like to on this show uh, catch a few extra names, you know, um, like Danielle or, Ooh. or Danny, D A N I. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I like the idea of female Dannys. Keep going. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so it, we're, we're, I'm just having fun with this. And really, I don't know if I brought this up on a previous episode, but I think it's important for people to find ways to root for each other, you know, to kind of get out of their bubble and say, hey, look what that guy's doing over there. Look what she's doing. That's that's awesome. So oh, it's yeah. kind of me getting people thinking whether their name is Dan or Danny like us or it's Alfonso, but like just to find a common thread. Um, so that's my contribution <laughs> is getting people thinking along those lines that Hey, there's someone out there kind of like you, and maybe it's just because you had the same name. That's true. Um, I agree with that. I think that I think your mission here is uh, is very uh, commendable, man. Well, thanks, Danny. And I understand. I didn't know that it had been this long, but you actually you're in musical theater, and that's your that's your love, that's your passion. I didn't realize that a 20 year gap had taken place um, between here, the here and now and what you're doing, the projects and the performances that you're working on and, and how long it's been since you've been back in the game. Uh, that's absolutely true, man. Uh, you are right. First off, let me say, you say musical theater to me and you say passion and that is absolutely true, man. There's nothing else that I want to do than to be on stage and sing and dance and act. It's like, Hey, uh, Dan, just give me a microphone and a spotlight and put me on stage and just let me go. And like, that's why this podcast is great especially for me right now, because you've given me a microphone and you're basically putting me on stage and saying, let's just go. So I mean, I'm a little nervous with all those people listening out there. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, dude. I don't get nervous uh, anymore. I mean, I remember back in the day when I did, uh, back in the day, like 20 years ago, you're right. Uh, it has been a long time for me. And let me tell you why it took so long. So I did musical theater in you know middle school and high school and in college at the University of Alabama. Uh, and then when I was done with college, like I haven't, you know, it's been 20 years and I did not do any theater. And the reason for that, I feel like I've learned is because I guess I didn't realize that I needed to pursue that kind of thing. You know, when you're going to school and you're doing theater class, you're going to be in shows, uh, cause you're just, you know, you audition in class, but when you're no longer in that kind of, uh, environment you have to like go out and find it yourself so um i love the musical hamilton it came to new orleans which is where i live now where i'm originally from and i went to go see hamilton four times within eight days and then i see the entire cast on the stage taking their final bows and i get goosebumps and i'm like man oh man that's all i, I want to do that i want to do that Again, yeah, uh, thinking it's really hard. And so, like, you know, that next week I went and auditioned, uh, and I got a show. And and now we're here, a year and a half later, and I got so many shows, and I've done so many. Danny, do you think that uh, even with people that are loaded with talent, or it's just like I say in the DNA, if enough pass, enough time passes, and you're on the sidelines, do you think? 
some doubt can creep in about your capabilities? You know, I didn't think about that, but now that you bring them, bring it up, I guess so, man. Yeah, because like I auditioned for this show, that first show that I was in, and like I had all my lines learned, and we're going up to, you know, run it, and not like in a production or a performance, but just for rehearsal, and like I get so hesitant and. I was really nervous about it, but that's because there was like a 20 year gap there. But after I did that show, I lost that nervousness until I moved to a bigger theater. And then I got that nervousness again. Cause I'm like, Oh wow. Now I'm with all of these people who are so much better than me. Um, what am I going to do? I'm going to mess it up. But then like, once we opened that nervousness went away. Uh, and then I went to a different theater, a professional one, where they actually paid me money to sing and dance and act on stage. Dan, can you imagine it getting paid for like having fun? Right. Uh, so like, that's what happened. And I didn't have any nervousness there, I guess maybe because like they, I feel like them paying me was like them saying, okay, dude, you're good enough to be here. So I guess I, I didn't get nervous at all. And I'm not nervous about the people in the audience. I'm just like nervous about messing it up for my other castmates. But now that I'm like past any of that nervousness, I can just go up and, and perform. I'll tell you this. If anybody out there that is listening, that is interested in performing in any like way at all, whether it be like reading poetry slams or playing guitar and singing, the number one thing that will make you successful is to not care about what people think and to not have that nervousness that just allows you to be yourself and to, to really like provide people with that entertainment that they either want or they don't need to, they don't know that they need. Yeah. I think that's great how you just put that. And, um, people maybe imagine that others are judging them or watching their every imperfection or, or misfire or whatever. And the reality is most people aren't, they're not hyper-focused on you. I mean, unless you just haven't prepared or something, but it, on the, by the same token, would you say that it's good to just run through those situations where you're a nervous wreck to just feel it, to just feel nervous and have that experience where you just sweat in all the places that you don't usually sweat and have your heart racing for a little while and to just get past that so that, you, it, you know, once you're done, you're like, okay, I don't think I... I think I've got myself worked up to the max. I don't have to reach that again. I don't have to go quite that far. I'm okay now. Uh, wait, what's the question? <laughs> Do I think it's a good idea for people to embrace that situation where they're feeling nervous? Yes. Uh, yeah, definitely. It's important because once you do that, like you say, you get past it. And then next time you'll either be less nervous or you won't be nervous at all. The more you do, it's like they say, you know, the more you do something, the better you're going to be at it. I don't know if anybody actually ever said that, but I feel like somebody should have said that. Uh, it's all about that uh, repetition, man. Repetition is what makes you feel comfortable to do those things. So, yes, even if you feel like it and it's the terrible and you're right sweating everywhere, just go up there, man, and just do it. What would you say about just the camaraderie being in music theater? How big of a role does that play in your enjoyment? Uh, well, being a person that is addicted to musical theater, uh, like I need to shoot musical theater up, up in my arm like every three hours every day. That's what it's like for me, just to kind of give you an idea uh, of how my life is. Uh, yeah, man, that camaraderie is like amazing to me because uh, I'll sit with my friends or whatever and make jokes or like they'll say a word and I'll sing a show tune. I'll sing a song with those words that they just said. And they're just like, what? Um, but you know, backstage with these people who are, uh, is fiercely like dedicated to that same, uh, thing that, you know, just like takes over your mind and body is amazing. Uh, like some of the, my best times are sitting backstage in the dressing room. Uh, here, for the, for instance, in Newsies uh, in, in the summer of this year. Uh, so that's a huge cast. 
a best show I've ever, ever in, by the way. Anyway, we had like four different dressing rooms and I was in the older people's dressing room because, well, I'm an older person. Uh, and we're, we're just sitting there and everybody's just like waiting for cues or whatever. And I just say something like, let me think of one in particular. There's a place for us. And like the next person will sing somewhere a place for us. And it's just like a game that we play. But if you know musical theater, then you know all of these things, and it's like in your brain, uh, and it's just like a great game for us to play. Those people are amazing. Uh, you should, everybody should have a musical theater friend in their life, because everything is coming up roses, and that's a line from a song from Gypsy. So like, see, we like talk in musical theater terms, and I can't do that with like you. I can't do that with like my other best friends in real life. But we have like this secret language and uh, and all we want to do is just like do that thing, man, which is just perform. And you know what? People are like, well, do you like the rehearsals? I mean, you got to hate the rehearsals to get to that performance stage, right? And it's like, no, I don't hate the rehearsal process. Every single day I have rehearsal, I cannot wait to get to rehearsal because I get to see all my people and we're all loving and hugging. And look, we all may not, we probably all definitely don't share all the same like political beliefs or uh, religious beliefs or things like that but that doesn't it doesn't even come up man uh we're not there for that we're just there to like have a good time and do what we love i'll tell you what uh, i'm a part of like three different theaters now and i have like these new groups of friends over the last year and a half who i will now go and uh, like next week we'll have a friendsgiving at one of their houses so like we just kind of like take anybody in and uh, uh, like you're part of the family. And I feel like that has a lot to do with like people being addicted to that same weirdness that you're addicted to. Like no matter what the situation is, I'm going to accept you, man, because you're like the same weirdness as me. And like we have that same thing. We call ourselves like theater nerds and theater nerds just need to stick together. And uh, I really do love all of these new people in my life over the last year and a half, man. I knew when I first met you, like you said, it was about 2010 or so, that mm -hmm. I couldn't put my finger on it, that you were in that community or destined to be a part of that community, but I knew, you were, I knew that you were a performer at heart, and you liked doing some wacky stuff. I remember, I'm sure you do too, the co-ed softball team, the Dirty Birds, that Emily and I assembled and your involvement, maybe we only did one or two games like that, but do you remember when you How could I forget? The How could I forget? Oh, you don't even need to ask me. Yeah, man, I remember. How could I forget? You gave me, look, I, everybody out there, I just want you to know that I have a game softball. They gave me the game ball for going to the recreational baseball field, the local recreational baseball field in Birmingham with a megaphone and with an iPad and an amplifier, and I'd be like, next up, ladies and gentlemen, standing at 6-3, the first baseman, Dan McCardle. And, like, I'd play some music for y'all. I think I even, like, let y'all pick your play on music or whatever. Yeah. But, yeah, do. man. Uh, awesome, awesome. And, you know, to have received – I still have that softball. It's in my garage. So, like, receive that. That's awesome. Because uh, I was just being, like, a weirdo. I just like I said, just put me on stage. Let me do some weird stuff. And you gave me like a game ball, and I was just having fun, man. I was there because my friends were there playing a game, and uh, I wanted to be a part of it. But I wasn't on the team, so like I found my own way to do it, and and to do that, and to get uh, a ball for like doing nothing in my eyes, uh, like a little trophy ball was was a good thing for me. That makes me think of like uh, here recently, earlier this year, I did uh, Jesus Christ Superstar, and I, I played Caiaphas. So then we had our annual gala for the 2022-2023 season and then I was uh I was nominated for uh, best actor in a musical for that particular role which you know I won and like they gave me uh like a standing ovation and a trophy that said best actor in a musical and I went up there and I told the people look guys I've been doing this for like 14 months and this is like uh the most amazing thing because I don't know how y'all feel about it but I'll tell you for someone to give me this type of uh, award for an accomplishment, it doesn't even seem like an accomplishment to me. I should be like giving all of those people an award 
an award for them for like putting me on stage and an award for the people in the audience for like clapping for me. It's like I said earlier, it's like getting money or getting accolades for like not doing anything for just being myself. So like, thank God I found this thing again, because what if I wasn't getting those accolades? I'd just be being myself without accolades and accolades makes me feel a lot better about life. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Danny, you've been in, uh, like you said, you portrayed the mayor in Newsies, Edsel Mackey in The Best Little Whorehouse in Texas. Yeah. Uh, Young Frankenstein earlier this month. Mm -hmm. uh, Singing in the Rain earlier in the fall. Um, you've got some, some great stuff coming up. I can't wait. I wish I could go. Maybe I can. I don't, we'll see the uh, Sister Act, the musical at Rivertown mm-hmm. Theaters. Which one that you've done in 2023 have you just had the most fun performing? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, They're probably all I've had, enjoyable for different reasons. They are. The one that I had the most fun, though, personally. It would have to be, well, let me think. Because I just told you that Newsies was like the best show that I was in, but that's because like all of the tap dancing and and the big the big orchestrations and stuff like that. But uh, I'm gonna have to say like probably singing in the rain. Oh my god, probably singing in the rain. How'd you know that? Why why'd you say that? I was just guessing. I felt uh, well, I was good. following a little bit when you were um, sharing updates about that show and that performance, and uh-huh. I'm like it just seemed like I guess what I was seeing in the photos like this is this is all danny this is he's in his element this is great i loved it you're right man it is that is what i am i'm like in my element uh and it would have to be i feel like it has to be singing in the rain only for like um personal like greed reasons because that was the biggest role that i've had since i played mr gilbreth in Cheaper by the Dozen in sixth grade at Simmons Middle School, directed by Philip Butler. Uh, I had like over 200 lines in that show, but my brain was a lot younger then, so I was able to learn those lines. And then now that I'm 41, I had like 90 lines, I believe, in uh, Singing in the Rain. Anyway, it was the biggest part that I've had here recently. And um, when I started this journey, after I saw that Hamilton stage show and was like, I want to do this. After I started that journey, I was like, oh, well, you know, can you just imagine? Like, I I feel like I will have made it. I will feel like if I had made it once I get a leading role at Rivertown Theaters, because, like, that's a regional theater here in New Orleans, and it's very well-known and very professional and things like that. Uh, And so then I got that role, and it was like, whoa, uh, I've got, like, a leading role in a musical at, like, a regional professional theater. Um. But then I, when I was done with that role, I was like, well, what's next now that I've made it? And then I realized, well, there's other places I can go from here. So then I auditioned with j the Jefferson Performing Arts Society, and they gave me a role in, uh, in Young Frankenstein. And, uh, and then after that show, they gave me another role in Jesus Christ Superstar, which is coming up in March of next year. And not only are they going to be performing it here in New Orleans, they're also going to be touring around. So, like, now I feel like I've really made it. But really, have I really made it? Because, no, there's, like, another step beyond that, and that's, like, national tours. And then there's a step past that, which is, you know, Broadway and stuff. But, look, that's not – I don't have my my sights, excuse me, set on those types of things. Like, that's not why I do it. I'm not doing it for money or to become – like famous or anything i just do it because it's what i like to do i just want to sing and dance and act like i said several times You're long following. answer to your question but yes so far it was singing in the rain what am i following you're you're following your bliss yes hey did you have I'm anybody come it. come up to you any directors after some of those first couple performances that were a little taken aback like they thought well this guy's been out of the game a long time um that had a good audition. Have you have you surprised some people with your your I don't know if you call it your chops? Yeah, I feel like maybe so. In that first show, in Stephen Sondheim's company, like the very first show that I got back doing, and I told you I felt really nervous about because it was the first time being back. Yeah, and I went up there during rehearsal and was like very hesitant 
and like uh, reluctant because of my nerves. But after that rehearsal, when I had all the nerves and I was like, well, shoot, guy, in my brain, I was thinking to myself, well, shoot, I learned all my lines. There's no reason for me to be nervous about it. I, I did fine up there. And then I wasn't any nervous. I wasn't nervous any longer. And then like just something like kind of like popped. And yeah, that show had a couple of producers and the director. The director doesn't really speak much. I used to say, I don't really think that guy even likes me. But, you know, other people were like, no, 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 no. He's just like that to everybody. He doesn't speak much. But, yeah, the producers came up to me and they're like, wow, we didn't know that you had that in you. And I was like, well, I knew it was in there somewhere. I just had to, like, figure out how to get it out. Uh, So I was, like, appreciative of that. And one of my castmates came up to me and said, oh, Danny, you're so talented. And I was like, whoa. And I'm like, I thought about that since. I was like, well, I love hearing that. Because, look, I've never, like, taken voice lessons or or dance lessons, or, I mean, I was in acting classes uh, in school, but just for somebody to uh, tell me that I have a talent for that thing and to not have worked on it, uh, that's pretty crazy. Uh, But I attribute that, and I know I'm rambling on, but I attribute that to, like, you know, my parents, uh, my dad, who uh, has written a bunch of musicals for Nord, which is the New Orleans Recreation Department. They have, like, a theater department, and he did that when he was, he started writing music for musicals when he was a teenager here in New Orleans. And uh, my mom was always a singer. She was like Maria in West Side Story uh, as a freshman in high school and, and then like sang professionally in um, clubs in Chicago. And uh, so I feel like I was born with like uh, something in me that like allows me to sing on key and to like take in those choreographed sorry, there's choreography uh, movements and like I'm able to like mirror them. I don't know. Like I'm just lucky to have like been born to these people who like gave me that stuff. And I I don't want you to think like I'm just like living off of that, man. I've spent the last like a year and a half singing uh, somewhere between six to eight hours a day, five days a week. So like 30 hours a week, I've been singing and working on my voice and uh and that's what my my current job allows me to do um which is awesome for me so like i can do my work and get paid like doing a real like nine to five job but i can also like work on my passion at that same time yeah and you gotta you know have your your nose in a book or reading over lines and studying lines there's a lot of i'm sure quiet reflective time or uh it's it's not all the stage lights and showtime you really got to put in the effort and the hours behind the scenes that's true and you're right it's not i mean the being on stage and performing is a small percentage of what all of you know all the time that we put into it um here's let me just tell you this real quick for anybody that's out there that wants to learn or that's interested in to like know how you learn so many lines and so many lyrics in a four to six week period which is the amount of time that it takes to produce a musical um this is what i do and i've learned that it works well for me i uh instead of just like reading the book and having the book in my hand at all times and reading my lines and try and memorize them what i do is i will go through the scene and i'll record it and then i will play that scene back with my lines in it and everybody else's lines and i'll listen to it in my uh my headphones and then the next thing i'll do is i'll take my lines out i'll re-record it i'll use everybody else's lines i'll leave my lines blank And that way I can uh, listen to all of them and then perform my lines to myself in my head. And then if you do that enough, like I said, man, repetition is the key to it all. So you do that enough, you're going to have all of those lines memorized. Once you have them all memorized, you can then start listening to these recordings that you've made. And you can work on your inflections and your uh, intonations and and things like that, like how I'm going to say the line or where I'm going to put the emphasis on the line and things like that. Uh, so you're right. It does take a lot of preparation, but that's my little trick for it. Here's like an even further step into that. Not only do I do it that way, but I will also run those lines through my headphones at like 1.5 times the speed and then like two times the speed and then three times the speed. Uh, and then I'll, I'll say my lines at that speed these quicker speeds that they're so you know they're like talking like uh You're getting into well, uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. chipmunk territory here that's right chipmunk territory you're right because look 
the way I do that is if I go so fast, once I'm on stage performing with people, everything slows down. It's like what they say when you're like a quarterback in the NFL and the older you get, the game kind of slows down for you. And that's kind of how it is for me, which allows me to be more uh, real, to, mo- to be more believable, I, I feel like. Speaking of quarterbacks, every once in a while on the Dan Time podcast, I will just go way off track for a second because I just got to ask. Danny, okay. I know you're a huge New Orleans Saints fan. Who do you miss more, Coach Sean Payton or Drew Brees? Who do I miss more or who dat I miss more? Who do oh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry, bad joke. Uh, oh, that's an easy answer, man. And oh, let me s- explain it like this. When I saw that the Denver Broncos had lost so many games early in the season, I was ecstatic. <laughs> because Sean Payton's their coach. Yeah. Uh, look, let me put it to you like this, Dan, for those Dan Time listeners. Look, if Sean Payton didn't have Drew Brees, he would have never have won a Super Bowl. Let me put it to you like this. If Sean Payton wasn't the head coach of the New Orleans Saints and Drew Brees was the quarterback, we would have won so many more Super Bowls. Oh. And that's the truth, man. Look, Sean Payton, whatever. The dude quits because, like, uh, uh, I don't have a quarterback. Uh, and then he quits and takes a year off and then goes to Denver. And I just hope that they just do terribly. Not because like I hate Denver, but because I hate Sean Payton. Um, Drew Brees was an amazing man. Look at the stats. Uh, that dude is the reason why the Saints were name worthy for a decade and a half. And it was not Sean Payton. You think Payton really said, "Hey, wait a second. I better get out of town here because I'm about to be exposed." Uh. I do. I absolutely do. He's like, I gotta I go find a real that. quarterback. Now, Breeze, did he get drafted by San Diego? I, I'm trying to remember now. He did. did. That's correct. Yeah. So what if he stays with the Chargers, never goes to to New Orleans? Nobody's ever heard of Sean Payton, right? Right. Uh, God, oh, oh, I see what you mean. Well, I mean, he would have been the Saints quarter, the Saints coach, and then Drew would have been over in San Diego. Um, yeah, probably not, man. He probably would have been like a a couple year coach. I think Danny. I think Sean Payton was carried by Drew Brees on his back. Danny, what is going on with the Patriots? Uh <laughs> this is getting uh, this is getting pretty ugly. Uh well look, I can assure you that it's not the quarterback's fault because he's a good Alabama boy. Well, University of Alabama yeah. boy. Um I don't know, man. I feel like uh you know, Tom Brady left and that was it. Maybe Bill Belichick is in the same boat as Sean Payton. I mean, I find that harder to believe. But, you know, Tom Brady won those championships for Bill Belichick, for sure, too. What's happening to them? I don't know. I think they're going through the regular pains of losing the greatest player of all time. You just can't replace a once-in-a-generation quarterback. Once in two generations. Right. You're talking about the Saints, right? Yeah, yeah. You're right, and we're learning that now. I mean, we're trying with Derek. Oh, you're talking about the Patriots. Well, look, both of them, uh, Brady and Breeze, were generational talents, man. Uh, and no, you can't, you can't uh, replace them. You got to get lucky. You got to hope that the guy that's going to be a star uh, is out there, and you go pick him up. And that's what we did with Breeze. And we just got lucky, man. We just got lucky. That's it. I feel like Breeze, he was never my guy, but I, I just feel like he's a really good dude, a good dad, and. Uh, just everything that I've read about him and, 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 you know, when you see him kind of post NFL career, he just carries himself with such class. And I don't feel like it's contrived either. Um, I agree with you. I think that's very true. Uh, and I don't know. I, I don't know if it's contrived or not. Uh, I feel like it needs to be something that's contrived by more starting quarterbacks. Because, uh, like, that's what you want kids to emulate. You know what I mean? They're going to look up to the sports star, and they're going to do what he does. But you want that sports star to be like a Drew Brees and not a, uh, a Deshaun Watson or a little a little girly girl like Tom Brady. You know what I mean? I hate to ask. Throwing tablets, breaking tablets on the side because he can't get a guy to catch. Come on, dude. Be a be a be a real person. Be like a a nice dude and just like go over to the guys and talk about it and stop being a little 
I hate to say the word woman or girl about it, but yeah, stop being, I just don't want to use a bad word. You know what mm. I mean? Yeah. We, uh, yeah, don't, don't, uh, push it right up to the edge here. I may run off some of my, uh, fervent lady listeners. All right. I know. I, I hear you. I'm sorry, ladies. Uh, I'm just trying to like make it kid friendly too, ladies. Right. Danny, speaking of New Orleans, you absolutely love this town. You love the sights, love the smells, the the buzz, the atmosphere, the restaurants. What are your summer, you know, when you guys wrap up a, a multi-night performance, do you all go out to eat somewhere or do you sometimes split off solo? What's a what's a restaurant that maybe people haven't heard of that you're like you got to try okay, this Okay, yes. I get it. I do love New Orleans, and I might love it more than normal New Orleanians. And I, and I attribute to that to the fact that I was born in New Orleans and then went to high school and college in Alabama and then was lucky enough to find myself back home in New Orleans. So, like, I was out of New Orleans for 15 or 16 years. So missing it for that amount of time, I feel like, made me love it even that much more. And now that I'm here, like, I'm not going to waste any time uh, doing New Orleans stuff. Uh, and you're right, the sights, the sounds, the smells. I mean, <clears throat> that could go both ways. So you're right. Uh, but you're right. <laughs> like, even like a crazy, nasty smell, you're like, oh, mm, that smells like the French Quarter, like the good old days. Um, <laughs> and that's, that's true. Uh, but after it smells a show, like uh, it smells like late nights gone by. Yeah. Uh, and that's like not the only thing gone by. But yeah, you're right. Um, normally after a show, we do try to get together. Um, uh, I like to, tr I like to offer to everybody in the cast uh, after a, a Saturday evening show to go to the French quarter. Um, I mentioned my dad earlier. See, he has a gig, uh, four nights a week in the French quarter at the Maison Bourbon, which is, a a bar on the, at 641 Bourbon street. And he's got a band and he plays either the piano or the tuba. It just depends on what he has available to him at his disposal as, as far as other, um, uh, as far as other musicians are concerned. If he doesn't have a piano guy, he's going to get on the piano, obviously, and, and vice versa. Um, so I, I try to bring them down there uh, uh, because it's live music. It's New Orleans. It's uh, alcohol. We all get to like hang out and, and party and, and have fun. And, and sometimes if somebody's feeling that, that they want to do it, my dad will get them up there to go and sing a song. But, you know, those theater guys, they're uh, real, real hesitant about that. So they don't like it in front of people. I'm just kidding, man. Um, <laughs> it goes off. It goes off really well. Um, and That's then in regards to so the cool restaurants, dad. Yeah, man, uh, it is really cool. But, you know, that could be like a whole discussion for another day. As a matter of fact, you should holler at my father and get him on here because let me just say one thing real quick. My dad uh, was Debbie Reynolds' rehearsal pianist in, in New York City for a Broadway show. And when Debbie Reynolds' show was opening, she asked my father if he would escort her daughter to the opening night performance that night. And her daughter, as I'm sure some of your listeners know, is Carrie Fisher, who I'm sure some of your oh, listeners yeah. know was Princess Leia. So, you know, my dad took Carrie Fisher on, on a couple of dates uh, way back in the day. And that's just like one little thing about uh, my dad, because he spent a lot of time everywhere doing music uh, internationally. Uh, that's a terrible segue, but to segue into the restaurant situation, um, man, there's so many good restaurants in New Orleans. I have friends come in town and say, where should I go eat? Honestly, you could go eat at a gas station. And that's like, I'm not even making a joke, man. There are gas stations here where you can go and get like a full, you know, like, meal with sides and everything or you can go get a po' boy which other people would call a subway sandwich but it's totally different than like subway the store um if i if you were in town tonight dan i would tell you to go to mandina's on canal street in mid city in new orleans it's uh, an italian restaurant uh with a lot of new orleans seafood and local favorites and um the amount of food that you get on one plate is well, it will feed you for like two or three sittings. So I'm all uh, be prepared to go home directly afterwards so that you can get to your refrigerator. Yeah. What time. If, if you got like a hour and a half hour, 15 minute drive and it's just, it's, your car is going to be filled with the, the smell of that dish that you <laughs> ate. It's well Absolutely. worth it. 
Absolutely. Oh, I hear you. It's like a, it's like an air freshener. That's a good idea, man. <laughs> right. I should just leave it in there next time and just see how it turns out. I'll probably get all the chicks that way. Danny, speaking of gas stations, and this is just what it's not really way out there, but people don't ask these questions on shows. They take themselves pretty seriously. What's your take, Danny, on Hunt Brothers Pizza? I guess they have them out there in New Orleans. The gas yeah, station. I know, what, I know what you're talking about. Ready by the slice. The logo is the two Italian guys, you know, flopping the dough in the air. Yeah, I I, I know what you're talking Do about. Do you ever succumb take on it? to that when you're just, it's lunchtime, you're busy, you're in a hurry, you're like, well, I guess this is going to be lunch today. I'm going to grab a slice here at this shell station, and I'm just going to eat this pizza. No, I don't do that. Lamp. No, I don't do that. I don't do that. I've had a piece of that pizza before, and it reminds me of uh, like high school cafeteria pizza. Just like a lot of oil. It doesn't have much taste to it. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like if you were to buy a, a DiGiorno or like a whatever out of the freezer section of that gas station, you would be better off and get more taste to it. But if you need like sustenance to fill you up, I understand people doing that. But here in New Orleans at those gas stations, like I said, you can get a pizza, piece of pizza. Or you can like talk to the guy behind the counter and be like, "Hey man, uh, let me get a roast beef po' boy, breast, uh -huh. uh, you know." And then you just eat that, and it's just a lot better. I bet you the Hunts, uh, the Hunts company is not really too profitable in New Orleans for that reason. Also, there's a lot of fried chicken that uh, they sell at gas stations here. Uh, they call it crispy, crunchy chicken, and I think they probably. Oh, have yeah. a monopoly on on the fast food at uh, gas stations. Yeah, we've got them here. Uh, usually, wherever okay. they're located, they've got the window decals. Where you, all you see mm -hmm. is just the crispy, crunchy chicken. Photo, up close photos of all this fried chicken as you're approaching the the store. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad to know that it's not just a New Orleans thing. Then, so I feel like they're. I feel like their market or their monopoly on the market is probably definitely better here in New Orleans than in other places. Just because, like, I feel like the real food is going to cancel out those uh, those uh, pizza pieces. Danny, do you have a routine? Uh, just speaking of every day, do you like have to get up and have that bagel and that coffee and the creamer? And and if anything is out of whack, it's it's just not right. Or do you just roll out of bed and here we go? Whatever happens, happens. Uh, I like to have my sandwich in the morning. I know that sounds weird, but I like wake up and then I get in my car and I eat my sandwich in my car to go to work. I need that sandwich, man. Sandwich for breakfast. Like, sandwich for breakfast. Do you want to know what kind? I'm going to tell you whether you do or not. It's Cajun turkey with Swiss mayonnaise, Creole mustard with some Tony Sacherets on uh, a French bread loaf. So that's basically like Cajun turkey and Swiss po' boy. And like, I feel like if I go to the McDonald's or I cook something at home, it's not going to be filling. You Do you agree that like breakfast food's not filling? Kind of leaves you want more, unless you really... I've got a system down for myself. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot of oatmeal, eggs, toast. I mean, I basically cram as much down... And it's usually all pretty healthy, but it's just a lot of little things. And it's like, okay, that's enough. But if you just, I don't understand people that have like one hard boiled egg or uh, one piece of dry toast. like that. Yeah, or like a sausage bacon or a sausage biscuit or whatever from the fast food place. That'll fill you up for like an hour and then you're hungry. And yeah, it's like three hours until lunch. Anyway, I want that big sandwich in the morning so I can eat it and like get my work done and then go to lunch and be full for the rest of the day. I don't like feeling um, hungry. So I need that big sandwich in the morning. And honestly, if I don't have that big sandwich in the morning, if I fail to have made it the previous <laughs> evening prior to waking up, then yeah, dude, things get out of control. Like I'll, I don't know what I'll do. I mean, I got to find something to eat and it's just like, and then it's like taxing on my brain because I got to get to work and yeah, I just need to have my sandwich. Look, I need to have my sandwich ready for me when I wake up. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I I think you and I are probably similar. I'm a hungry guy. I'm ready to eat when I'm ready to eat, and I do not want to think about where am I going to get a meal here in the next 20 minutes because I am just famished. 
and you're trying to focus, like you said, you're, you're at work, and you're like, I don't, this is all out of whack. Can't handle it. Right. Hey, do you know what kind of work I do? No, I don't. Okay, well, I'm just going to say it real quick. Uh, I work for the federal government. Um, I work as a clerk for you know, the United States Postal Service. Well, as soon as you said federal government, I was about to say, you know, you must know all about me. Yeah, well, I, it's not. I mean, your address and stuff, and what kind of mail you get sent to you, but not all about you. Like, it's not like you know, a Department of Justice or anything like that. And it's just like the United States Postal Service. Um, but when I moved to New Orleans like 12 years ago, I started working at the Hustler Club on Bourbon Street. And I remember walking down Bourbon to get to my job at Hustler. And I was, I'd literally say to myself, oh, look, there's like, a, there's like a brass band coming down Bourbon Street towards me as I'm walking past it to get to work. And like, there's, you know, guys playing drums on the sidewalk on their buckets. And I say to myself, literally, I am in my element. Because, you know, I'd been away from New Orleans so long. But now, for real, the new me being in my element is just like doing musical theater. So like, I feel like every single decision that I've made in my life, Dan, whether they were bad or good, were good because that's where I am now. And uh, I don't want to be doing like anything other than that. So that is a great way of putting it. And especially for people who listen to this show that regardless of how you just blew off the past seven or eight years, maybe if you did, or you lived in that town and you're like, that wasn't right for me. That, city wasn't me that girlfriend that i spent four years with what in the world happened there <laughs> it's all about the here and now would you agree just uh yeah you know, absolutely you're here and now's the time to seize the moment i'm actually having more fun in my 40s than and i thought i was having fun in my 30s i really did same man same i mean i was having fun in my yeah. 30s or 20s but like having fun in your 40s i feel like the fun that i'm having now is like more beneficial it's like a growing kind of fun as opposed to a like staying where you're at kind of fun you know what i mean and you finally you've got when you've got that creative outlet that you've been seeking for so long and you've, you're finally sinking your teeth into it there's got to be no better feeling right no better feeling man no better feeling no. uh it's all I want to do. Sorry. How about when you're on stage? I know the lights are bright, but can you ever see faces out there and just you're in the middle of your performance, middle of your lines, but do you ever see people and you're thinking, look at them. They are having the time of their lives and, and I'm a part of this show. Can you tell when people are just filled with joy? Yeah, but uh, it's like not really a visual thing because you're right. The lights are bright and you can't really see faces out there or even if the house lights are on and you can see the faces out there you don't want to be like seen as looking into the audience because mm -hmm. like that's not acting it's not acting you gotta be like making eye contact with your <laughs> your uh other people in you know the other people in the in the cast um but yeah. i'll tell you this though if you're sitting backstage or in the wings and you can hear the audience's response like their vocal response and their response when they're applauding, like when you hear it, man, and you know it and you're like, Oh wow. Oh wow. That is a good audience. <laughs> and yeah. you know what that does for you. That just like gives you that more energy and that more excitement. And you go out there and you continue to give us, you give even more than you were giving earlier. And you feel like earlier you were giving 110%, but now you're like, you're like, okay, well these people appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Now they're, now we're really going to do it. And just like, and then the house and then the roof blows off and uh, it's a big party. Wow. Danny, I also like to bring up or ask my guests when you're in some of those transitional periods or jobs that it's not really what you wanted to be doing, or maybe you, you were where you wanted to be at the moment, um, like at, at uh, Hustle Club. Did you make some contacts that you hang on to to this day, like some of your best friends maybe came from some period in 2015 or something or – um, uh, yes, so for I, sure. Me and you, we met in, I think, 09 or 10 in, mm -hmm. in Birmingham. Uh, for sure, man. Uh, yeah, there's like some relationships that I still hold close to me from those times in the quarter, from, from all my quarter rat friends. That's what we used to call ourselves. Still do. 
the quarter rats. That's what we are. Um, or we, I was, and there still are people that are quarter rats who I'm still friends with. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I had uh, some people came in town for a bachelor party and they went, I think it was Saturday night uh, or no Friday night, two nights ago. Uh, and they're like, Hey Danny, what can we do? And I, you know, I called the GM over at Hustler because we're good friends. This lady, look, there's a, oh my God, it's a whole nother tangent. Look, New Orleans has a lot of Mardi Gras parades. One of the Mardi Gras parades is called Muses. Muses is an all-female parade. This all-female parade has a signature throw that they throw from their, par- their, their floats. That um, signature throw is a uh, individually decorated stiletto shoe. So um, this lady who's in charge of like three clubs on Bourbon Street, three gentlemen's clubs on Burma street contacts my mother like every several weeks and says, okay, Miss Peggy, we got another uh, bag for you. And those bags are like garbage bags full of these shoes that are huge. Some of them are not huge, but like, man, these are like professional entertainer shoes. They're not like stilettos that a lady would wear to like a ball. These are like huge shoes and they're like a canvas for my mother. And then she's able to decorate these and, you need to see a Muse's shoe one of these days. Anybody that's listening, y'all need to Google what a Muse's shoe looks like. And they're like absolute beautiful pieces of art. So like that connection that I made back in Hustler way back in the day is helping my mom out. And it's also gave my friends a free bottle of alcohol the other night for their friend's bachelor party. Um, I also have friends who, who are really good friends and we will go out to like the festivals that we have during festival season, like Jazz Fest and French Quarter Fest, we'll just meet up down there and, and hang out, or you'll just see them when you're on the parade route. Uh, New Orleans is like the biggest little city in the world or like the littlest big city in the world. Like if I go out today anywhere, I'll definitely like see somebody that I know. And like those relationships stay the same. Um, the reason like I had to leave that quarter rent life is because the uh, timing, you know, the time that I worked, uh, among other things, was not conducive to friends and family, like working in the middle of the night and getting off of work at like six or seven in the morning and then going to the bar and hanging out with all your coworkers and, uh, and entertainers. Like that's not conducive to having like family and friends time. And I'm not talking like family time, like wife and kids, because I don't have that. Um, uh, I'm young at heart and I feel like uh, I'll continue to be that way as long as I'm like not kind of tied down in that way. And I don't like judge anybody that is, that does have their family like that. But what I'm saying is I want to be able to like hang out with my mom and dad and my nieces and nephews and sister and all that jazz. And, you know, and like I said, that was a time, that's why it was time to change from managing hustler to going to the uh, post office. Well, at least you had the support of your family while you were there and you meet some people. I mean, I don't recommend that everybody, uh, gets into just even a service industry job late at night. I mean, maybe right. maybe it's better for a teenager or someone that's 21, 22 to work retail. I mean, I saw a lot of ugly things in uh, uh, the late night lifestyle that some of those establishments kind of spit you out into. You know, if you're if you're yeah. ready for it and you want to jump in, it's all there. But um, but you do meet some people that have some redeeming qualities and you meet people who are kind of a mess and then they get themselves together and you, yep. you stay friends and you, you do, you do, I'm sure you saw some people who carried it a little too far and yep. uh, it's just kind of like a shame to see the deterioration with some people. It's just bound to happen. That's true. I feel like you have to go in with like a certain mindset and some people don't necessarily have that mindset but it's important for you to like make sure that you know like there's another life outside of late night craziness you know what i mean it's a very insulated world like it's you're living in this bubble and you wake up you know you get up whenever you need to or have to (laughs) noon or one or two and you go take care of your business do some online bill pay uh, if you've got a yard to cut, maybe you cut the yard. You do things that you have to do, but then you go back to that lifestyle that a lot of people don't live, don't have any interest in living. But uh, but you obviously found a way to navigate just the different trails in 
not go too far off the deep end while still having a good time. You're right. Um, well, like I said, man, every decision I've made was the right decision to put me where I am right now, which is like the happiest I've like been in life for real. And I love hearing that. Danny, you're one of the guys, um, I mean this sincerely, that I wish I could see you more often. You made such an impression the short time that we did have hanging around each other. You're an unforgettable guy. I'm not just saying that. I think anybody that's that's kind of meant for the stage has that that quality to them. It just they don't really remind you of somebody else that you know. So I'm glad that we made our connection when we did. And Absolutely, I'm glad that it's uh it's like stayed strong through since then as well. Um, I think it all really kind of blossomed, Dan, with our um, mutual love of uh, those North Siders, Chicago. In Chicago. Guys. Yeah, you're right. I was about to bring that up. Oh, I ruined it, everybody. I'm sorry. Danny, uh, are are you okay with the way the season ended? I mean, I think most Cubs Cub fans are just, you know, we had the disappointment of missing the playoffs, but then all of a sudden we got Craig Council. So yeah, you're just immediately I mean, we talk, thinking ahead. We could talk all about that if you want to, but you know what? It just occurred to me that uh, since you and I have uh, spoken last, the Saints have won a World Series. So why don't we just kind of like focus on that, dude? The Let Saints. me ask you, what were you? No, no, no. Did I say the Saints? My bad. The Cubs. The Cubs won a World Series. That's right. Uh, yeah. Since I spoke to you last. So what are you? Uh, what were you doing when the Saints? I'm sorry, the Cubs. I keep on getting it crazy. What were you when the Cubs won? I was at O'Reilly's Irish Pub in Pensacola. My brother Travis drove down, spent the night, and. It was a long night. We uh, made a couple other stops, and it was, you know, I, I wasn't, I, I'm, I'm not a part of some Cubs community down here. I mean, there's all mm -hmm. those drinking clubs if you want to join them, but um, I had to go out to watch it. I could not just sit in my living room and watch Game 7 on TV. I had to be out somewhere and, and, and go someplace where I knew they'd have the game on, nothing else, and the sound. And I really, mm -hmm. at that time, loved that bar. Uh, but that's where we were, and I was fortunate enough to watch it with my brother. He was a little concerned. I was <laughs> having a good time, so by the by the time we reached, the, I think, the ninth, tenth inning, uh, the rain delay, I was never really concerned that we were going to lose. But looking back, I mean, wow. If, if yeah, the delay wow. hadn't happened, you know, I think it was about a half-hour delay, we were probably going to lose that series. We were down three games to one. Yeah, uh, people forget that, and that was right on the edge. I mean, the Cleveland Indians almost should have been world champions that year, but yeah, that's what we were doing, and it was. It, I'll never forget it. How about you? Uh, what a what a great day to uh, to be alive as a Cubs fan, man. Um, perennial perennial losers, and then we we win the big one. So like you know, look at us, look at us go. Um, where was I? Won, I was at I was at work. I was going to so say I was watching it at work. I was going to say 2016 was probably the best time that this could have happened because I just met Natalie that summer. We didn't have any kids yet. Yeah, it gets a little harder sometimes with the little ones to watch complete games or to certainly go out downtown and hang out for three hours and watch a ball game. So for them to I win it when that. they did, it was it was good. I, I can't have a night like that again. <laughs> well, well, look, I bet you if I bet you if the Cubs make it to the World Series, you could probably find a night off. I, I'm sure. Oh, I think your wonderful so. Wonderful wife would. Yeah. So, like, you don't try to trick us, man. Come on, Cubs in the World Series, you'll find your three hours. I assure you. But now, so you were at work. I was at work, and at the time, I was working at Hustler, so uh, I was just in the manager's office in the back with the TV on, watching it. Did you have? Couldn't miss it, man. Were, were there fans there? Were there guys in the club that were watching the stage, but also maybe looking over at the bar TV? Yeah, when there's like when there were big uh, games like that, yes. And we put like the uh, projector in the courtyard on the wall. So yeah, there was a lot of people around there uh, to watch the uh, baseball game. Danny. But never, never is it always everybody's watching sporting events in a, an establishment like that. 
Danny, does the talent ever stop what they're doing because they're just a huge Saints fan or L.A. Lakers fan? There's just this big game going on. Does that, can that ever happen where they're not on stage at the moment and they're just chatting up some guy and they just like, hey, I got to watch this, this inning here? Honestly, no, Dan. Uh, the stages are never empty. Now, look, if there's an entertainer that says, uh, this guy wants to spend $1,000 on me right now, uh, we will find another entertainer to take the stage. But I'll tell you this, you can't ever have the stage empty. So, like, even before that entertainer comes off the stage, that second entertainer has to be on the stage. I could see that. Yeah. It's important, man. That's what those clubs are all about. Danny, what, are, is security pretty busy? Are there many altercations or fewer than? Yes, there are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there are. Oh, man. This could be like a whole other podcast oh, itself. Yeah. Uh, but yes, look, uh, as the manager of the club at times, I would um, drill my hospitality or security guys because, uh, you know, there would be like shootings uh, down the street. And we say go into lockdown and, you know, we would close these doors and put the big piece of wood through the doors like it's a castle. And then close the door on the balcony until we hear the all clear from our eye in the sky, who's the guy that watches all the cameras because um, he's got external cameras on the building and internal cameras as well. So we wait for the all clear. But, yes, there's been a lot of situations um, like that, e even situations in the club, man, um, which were like just crazy to have witnessed. Uh, for instance, look, this one particular club hustler has a pole from its main stage the top of the ceiling on the second floor uh so it's like a 30 foot pole and in the second floor which is the vip you can overlook that main stage but also if you're overlooking that main stage you're also overlooking other uh guests of the establishment so in this particular case it was a, a bachelor party or something it was a party of the sorority guys not sorority fraternity guys right sorority hey guys. it's new orleans it's new orleans and in the french quarter it could be sorority guys calm down stop judging <laughs> Um, but yeah, it was like fraternity guys up there and they spill their drink over the edge onto these Marines and these Marines run up the stairs, run over to the bottle service, grab the bottle out of the ice bin and like hit this dude over the head and knock him out. And there's like blood everywhere. And then these Marines run out of the building. I don't believe ever to have been caught. And then, you know, of course we have the cops come and, uh, EMS come and take the dude out and the dude lived and everything. He survived. That was fine. Thank God. Um, I'll tell you this, working in the quarter, state police are like military compared to city and local police. Like they, those state, pol those state troopers do not mess around, man. Mm -hmm. I could see that when it's, when it's time to throw down, they're not going halfway. Mm -mm. And like, they'll even throw down before it's time to throw down how, how, how crazy and hardcore they are. Hmm. Well, yeah, we could they're go just down. They're nipping it in the bud in that case, you know. They're just, like, getting to the point where they need to be before it takes time to get there. Well, you definitely had to be all business. I never saw that side of you, but I could see it. I could visualize Danny Rubio. No nonsense. <laughs> uh, I suppose so. I mean, a little bit of nonsense, but when I needed to be, there was no nonsense. But always at that establishment, they called me Danny Boy. Danny, just so you yeah. know, it wasn't Danny. Right. Yeah, Danny Boy Rubio. I was going to ask, when when did the nickname come about? Obviously, you don't, you don't shoot out the gate, so to speak. Uh, is Danny, is, is your given name Daniel? It is Daniel, yes. Uh, I, did... I was always called Danny. Uh, and my father's name is Danny or Daniel as well. So everybody it's growing beautiful. up, I was little Danny, you know. Anyway, I started working at Hustler, and we all have these radios, right? And people on the radio is like, Come back, Danny. And you know, I'll be like, I'll be like, yeah, what do you need? But at the time there was three managers, one of which his name was Jamie, the other's name was Kelly, and then I'm Danny. And sometimes people don't know how to use the radios. So they're like, so instead of saying Danny, come back, it sounds like E, come back. So I don't know if they're saying Jamie, Kelly, or Danny. So I tell them, All right, guys, look, if you want me, just call me Danny Boy. So at least that way I get E boy, come back. And I'm like, okay, well, they're actually asking for me. Thank God. Um, so that's how it started. And then there's I like a joke. Knew. So, yeah, that's how that started. And, like, uh, I started putting Danny Boy on my business cards for Hustler. 
And then everybody just started calling me Danny Boy, and somebody gave me a, jer- a Saints jersey that said Danny Boy on the back, and then I became Danny Boy. I was like, well, I guess I should change my name on Facebook to Danny Boy. Um, but I've since taken the boy out of it because I don't want to be known as Danny Boy for like um, when you're... theater reviews and stuff. You know what I mean? Okay, yeah, I could see that. I uh, I never knew the backstory, but that's the backstory, man. Yeah, they're they're reviewing um, Sister Act or Jesus Christ Superstar and Danny Boy Rubio. Right. But look, I think I'm going to change my name another time because, you know, I got this review that said, like, uh, Danny Rubio d- did some great dancing or whatever in, uh, in this last show, uh, Young Frankenstein. And I'm eating lunch with my dad, like, a couple of days later. And one of his friends from like four years ago says, oh, Danny, it's good to see you They're talking to my dad. He goes, wait a minute, were you, were you and young Frankenstein? And he's like, no, 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 that was my son, Danny. So like, uh, you know, my dad being like a local musician in New Orleans and me doing like what I'm doing, I don't want to get that confusion. So I think I'm changing my name officially to Daniel C. Rubio, which is my given name. So I'm not really changing it. I'm just... Uh, Look, everybody uh, on like Facebook, it. if you see it say Daniel Rubio, just know it's the same guy. It's like something I'm like fighting myself with. I want to do it, but I don't want to do it, you know? This is an internal struggle going on as we speak. <laughs> it really is, man. I'm, uh, I haven't even talked to anybody about it yet. And now I'm just opening myself up to everybody out there. <laughs> Danny, are you the type of person that can spend a significant amount of time alone on a day and a half or something where you got just some, some downtime. Uh, can you, do you wander the city by yourself? Do you like it or do you like to be with a buddy, with a pal, with a few people? What's your, what's your, speed uh, I prefer to not be all by myself. I would say, yeah. Uh, if I am all by myself, it would be, I feel like the World War II Museum is down here in New Orleans, and I love history. Uh, so I feel like uh, I go to the World War II Museum a lot, probably like over 100 times since I've had a membership there. But that's like if there's nobody to like hang out with. But, yeah, I would definitely like to just like hang out with people and like create if we can. Like my friends know that if we're hanging out and there's nothing to do, they're like, hey, dude, do you have your car tar? And I always do because I always have my guitar in my car. So I always have my car tar. Uh, it's called my car tar for a reason. So like we just like to create and stuff. And uh, like me and a couple of my friends right now are, are writing a musical about the Battle of 1812, uh, but more specifically about the pirate Jean Lafitte and how he and his men and his, uh, his uh, cannons like shaped that battle and saved i mean even though the battle was already over due to the treaty of ghent but it never you know it never made it to america in time so they actually fought this battle in new orleans with andrew jackson at the helm anyway so you know we try to just, i try to be creative all the time man so and it i find it easier for me to be creative with other people's input in that situation so i'd rather just like hang with people than to be by myself and if I am by myself, I'm going to use that stuff like researching or learning. And I guess that's why the World War II Museum kind of like jumps in, you know. Danny, if someone puts you to the test and you're just in a park and there's a fountain and said, hey, Danny, just go up there, stand up on the ledge of the fountain and just launch into a performance, maybe about yes. five, six, seven minutes long. Yes, yes. You would do it. Yes. I don't know the question, but I said yes. <laughs> now that I know the question, I'm going to have to say yes. Uh, yeah, dude, absolutely. Uh, I said it before. Give me a stage. Give me a spotlight. Give me a microphone. And let me just go. Yeah, it doesn't even have to be on a fountain. It could be like on a sidewalk. Uh, <laughs> if, right. uh, if, if somebody just like, inspires me or, or whatever. They want me to – I want to perform all of the time, Dan. So if somebody like – shows interest in that it's going to happen what about uh this is just another new orleans question and i'm going to have to Mm -hmm. rein it in because i could just keep going and going i could too dude uh danny are you a willie nelson fan 
Yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. Do you like his version? I guess it's his version of City of New Orleans. Uh, I, I, I don't feel like I'm well enough versed in that to a lot say of, whether I do or don't. There's a lot of New Orleans songs or with New Orleans in the song title. Do you mm-hmm. or do you have a favorite song about the city? It's kind of like an ode Ooh. to the city, and uh, you know, like Chicago's in uh, Chicago's an easy one. Uh, Sweet Home Chicago. I wouldn't even think of that one. I would think like my kind of town. Oh Chicago yeah, Chicago is or Chicago, Chicago, that Babylon town. And um, you, you also like here I go again, but Frank Sinatra. Yeah, I know. I took it out of your mouth, didn't I? The crooners, the Sinatra, Love Dean them. Martin. Love them. Love them. Look, in high school, my license plate said Sinatra. So that kind of like explains to you. And people were like, who's this Sinatra guy? And it's in Birmingham, Alabama. I feel like that has to just do like with who I was born to and where I kind of grew up. Ooh, my love for like those jazz standards and those dudes. Um, I do, I do love those, uh, those crooners, man. That's my stuff. Um, to answer your question about the song about New Orleans, I'm going to have to say like, uh, one that was made popular by Louis Armstrong. Uh, here, I'll just sing it for you. Won't you come along with me down that Mississippi? We'll take the boat to the land of dreams. Steam down the river, down to New Orleans, oh, Basin Street. It is the street where all the boys and good girls meet down in New Orleans. It's the land of dreams. You never know how nice it seems or just how much it really means. Uh, that one's called Basin Street Blues. Oh, uh, stop it. Oh, stop it. This old thing. This old thing. Stop it, Dan. <laughs> Folks, that was your price of admission right there you had to wait about an hour however long we've been talking but i hope you made it this far wow i'm gonna have to have you back on just uh so you can sing us you can regale us or what, what's what, what's the word i'm looking for serenade i don't know I, serenade i don't know what the word is but i'll do it uh, if you need me song somewhere to sing a song i will do it and if anybody finds their like selves in the new orleans area uh, they should come and see Scrooge at Dockville Farms, and that's December 1st through 3rd of this year. They should also come and see uh, Jesus Christ Superstar, which is the third week of March of 2024 at Jefferson Performing Arts Society. Or they can come and see uh, Sister Act, the musical, which is also located in New Orleans at Rivertown Theaters. And that is going to be in May of 2024. Sorry, I had to put those plugs in. Uh, you beat me to it. And I was going to say, this episode will be out on the 26th. So, folks, you got plenty of time. Should have about a week if you want to catch the uh, Scrooge performance, Scrooge the Musical. Danny, this is this has been wonderful. Can we can we just talk through the evening and um, just see how long? No, I'm just kidding. We could, man. We could. But look, uh, you're right. I do have some. I, I know you're kidding. But I totally would. I do also have to like learn some lines and lyrics for the Screw Show, so that's kind of what's on my plate for the rest of this Sunday. But definitely, look, man, let's have me back again if if you want for real, and I'll sing you a song or two. I'll get my dad to hop on the piano, and we'll just do some live jamming for you, bro. Oh, I can't wait. Are you and you and your dad, or are you and your sister? Everybody texts each other, you know, family members and. Uh, sends pictures. Do you do you do all the liking and the loving and the the hearts and those types of replies? Are you in on that with the family group text? Uh, wait, are you saying do I put the like thing or the heart thing on people's yeah, text? Yeah, somebody sends yes, you a picture and it's a cute picture, or lovely. Um, yeah, I'll put a little heart or a a like, but I like tend to tend to more. Uh, often than not, like, make a real response with, like, words and stuff. Do you ever use the double exclamation point? The yes, reaction. after, after, oh, oh. I don't know if you're on. I see what I, you mean. Oh, I'm an iPhone. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yes, I do use the double exclamation, but those are very limited. Uh, I feel like it's hard to know when and where to use a double exclamation. Uh, I find it easiest for me to like 
use that double explanation when I'm like, hey, Dan, so what is your answer on the, the, the question that I asked? And people are like, I don't even know what question. And it's like, oh, you freaking idiot. Well, I'll scroll up and I'll just double explanation that question that I already texted them. Just to like be like, I feel like the double explanation is like an upside down I and that I in my brain stands for like idiot. So it's just like, idiot, look at this. Uh, yeah, wh where's that coming from? I don't know. They, and there's also the question mark. Yeah, the question mark is obviously understandable. Look, I understand, and I appreciate you asking about this, but like, <laughs> let me. Not, that makes me think about people on Facebook liking and hearting things. How hard is it to make a like or a heart? Uh, if I see somebody post some stuff that I like, I'm gonna like it or I'm gonna heart it. And then I have people come up to me in real life, and they're like, "Oh, I saw your post the other day. I really like that." It's like, dude, why didn't you like it or heart it why on didn't Facebook? You like it? Why do you yeah. have to tell me in real life? You know what I mean? How hard could that have been? You said how hard there, you could it have it. been? You looked at it for three and a half, four seconds. You studied it. You zoomed in. You opened. You looked at the picture, yeah. but you yeah. couldn't be troubled to just Shameful. throw your name in the bucket of the hearts and the thumbs up and uh yeah it's it's not not a good thing and people really need to stop hiding behind that that curtain i agree with you man and pay no attention to man behind the <laughs> curtain but you know stop hiding behind it too okay danny we got to wrap up here but do you have do you have a favorite musical of all time I mean, that's maybe a tough question. Maybe it's an easy question. Um, is there anything that yes. you're just like, I could watch this thing a dozen times and never get tired of it? Yes. Yes. Um, and look, it's not really a hard question, only because I've been asked it a lot. And the only reason I've been asked it a lot is because uh, that's like a common question that I like to ask my castmates. Like when there's downtime, like what else is there to do? Oh, hey, what, what's your favorite musical? Um, and we'll go through that conversation. So I feel like my favorite musical has to be uh, Les Miserables, the great, mm -hmm. I don't know, I just love the music and stuff. But there's definitely other ones that are in there. I like to answer the question with like a top three or a top five because I don't want to leave any out. And I don't feel like Les Mis is really worthy to be my favorite. I feel like there's probably other ones that should be up there. But I just like that music so much that that's like my kind of go-to answer. Um, and the other ones are kind of like, you know, you can't like leave Hamilton out of that. I know it's not like classical Broadway, which is what I really love, but it's like new age Broadway. And it's just like a great form of entertainment. But also I like to go back to, you know, Oscar Hammerstein and, and Richard Rogers is, uh, like Carousel, the guys who wrote, um, who wrote, uh, a lot of those famous shows like the sound of music and stuff. What but about, Carousel's probably up there as well. What about Cats? No, I hate that show. Won't ever listen to it. I'm glad you brought it up. I don't know what the heck. I mean, I know what Andrew Lloyd Webber was thinking. He's got a lot of cats, and he loves cats. And he's like, oh, hey, guys, watch me. I'm going to write a musical about cats. It'll never do anything. And they put it on stage, and all these freaking people are loving it. Dude, waste, waste of time and effort. Uh, I have no interest in that show. I can't even believe you brought it up to me but no no cats i'll tell you what though andrew lloyd weber does have a great one out there i mean he's got jesus christ superstar which is great but that's not like a classical broadway musical but he also has phantom of the opera which is a classical broadway musical and that one's going to have to be in my uh top five musicals as well so it's really hard to like pinpoint one down but if somebody held a gun to my head i'd say les miserables just because i don't want to be killed and that's an easy answer to say pretty quickly what's your favorite musical Oh gosh, of all time, um, maybe maybe Encanto. Okay, okay, no. and look, no, it's it's a no, good it's answer. Not. I don't want you to get it wrong. Look, Disney cartoons are Broadway musicals. Yeah, what, they are. It is. Do you like the the new batch of of children's movies that are? It seems like most of them are musicals. Yes. What kind of question is that? Look, I don't want to be like labeled as a Disney lover. But Disney movies are Broadway musicals, and they're mainly like focused towards the younger generations or the you know towards kids and stuff. But yeah, man, I love them. Uh, you know, Lin Manuel Miranda did those shows for Disney, and that stuff's great. I wasn't 
I don't think I'd ever watched The Sound of Music until seven or eight years ago and was just oh, wow. dating someone who loved it. And we were watching it one night, and mm -hmm. I guess I would I'd throw that in the mix. Um, you know, I don't know how you feel about that as far as top five, top, top ten. Yeah, I hear you. Well, the guys that wrote that show have other shows that are better than that show. And Sound of Music is one of the greatest musicals of all time. If, I mean, if you ask if you ask people that know, uh, but they have even better ones that aren't like mainstream as popular as the Sound of Music. Like like I said, Carousel and, or West and other Side ones Story. like that. West Side Story. What about it? Is that a, is that a favorite? No, no. But I mean, it's good. There's nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with it. But the music is not like the music is not it's not like big showy musical music to me uh mm -hmm. and that's what i need in my life is big showy musical music yeah rocky horror picture yeah. show is that a musical i thought it was a movie uh you know it may, i guess it may encanto is a musical there. too um Man, I don't want to. I don't want to alienate myself from everybody, so I'm not going to say anything. Well, Danny, <laughs> I've taken up way too much of your time. Uh, to be fair, you've taken up a lot of my time too. Um, so, uh, but wow, time well spent, time well wasted. Did we spend it? Did we waste it? Doesn't sound like a waste to me, man. Never. I had I had so much fun. Uh, speaking to you. I look forward to the time when I can ask you the questions because I know you have a lot inside of you that you need to get out to. Yeah, you know, that's something as this uh, podcast evolves, I want to flip the script maybe towards the end of the episodes and let the guest just ask away. Um, but it's something that I, tr I really try not to put too much of myself and my opinion out there unless oh, I get it. the conversation starts calling for it. But I Understood. But you are a Dan... As I uh, understand, so it would totally make sense for you to do so. You are a Dan, as I understand. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a lyric, man. I think so. Okay, thanks Danny. for having me so much, dude. It was it was really fun. Thanks for asking the questions. Yes, and please come back on. Uh, let's just say I don't know in the spring sometime as we get close to next summer. Whenever you get another little break, let's uh, let's check back in, Danny Rubio. Just the perfect guest. And, oh, once again, this old thing, stop it. <laughs> um, okay, folks, remember, it'll be this coming weekend, Scrooge the Musical at Dockville Farm. Uh, we got Sister Act the Musical at Rivertown Theaters. That's coming up in uh, March. May. Uh, in May, I'm sorry about that. Jesus Christ Superstar at JPAC, presented by Jefferson Performing Arts Society, March 15th to 24th. That's right. Go see... What I know about Danny and things that I don't know about Danny Rubio. And there's your ride. So, uh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's New Orleans for you, baby. Uh, it's good to hear that. It's good to hear them moving around. Um, thank you again so much for having me, Dan. Uh, I'll continue to listen to your show. And, uh, I hope everybody continues to, uh, to tune into it. And I do look forward to our spring. Uh, our spring fling that we have here soon. And I'll have the You Are a Dan as I understand, song ready to perform for you that night. Yes. Danny, one final quick question. Would you, if someone gave you a gift card to a spa for a Manny Petty, are you, are you all in? I've never done it before, but sure, why not? Okay. On that note, I don't know why that one came out, but it did. Folks, remember, if you've got the itch for whatever it is, and you feel like, no, I've been on the sidelines too long. It's a young man's game. I, I don't know if I got it anymore. Get that thinking, that negative thinking out of your head. Start scratching out some ideas. Look for an opportunity. Use, use your network. You know people if you're of a certain age. And find a way to get back in there. Danny's a great example of somebody who had to twist around for a while, do some stuff, whatever. And he's back, and he's back in a big big way and i'm so and proud. better than ever and better than ever i'm so proud to call him call him a friend call him a fellow cub fan and other things that we share in common and danny you have a great rest of the evening and folks you have a great rest of the week 
And we'll see you next Sunday on the Dan Time Podcast. Thanks so much, Danny. Thank you. Love you. Bye-bye. All right. If you love that episode, if you're enjoying the Dan Time Podcast, be sure to download and subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can reach me at dantimepod at gmail.com. If you've got a free finger tap and you can scroll down and pop in a five-star review, I'd be thrilled, thrilled if you do that. Uh, you don't even have to leave your name or your email. You don't have to write anything. But, I mean, I'd appreciate a written review as well. If you really want to connect with Dan Time through the week, visit any of the social media pages. I'm on X, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. You can't miss me. I don't think. Um, and if nothing else, as I've said before, just talk about the show. If you're having a good time with it, tell your friends about it. Send a text about it. I appreciate you as a listener. Hope you have a great week. I'll see you next Sunday.